So, hey, folks, I'm super excited to, to talk uh, to everyone here today. Um, for those who were not able to join us in, in KubeCon last week, we were able to launch uh, Fluentbit 3.0, uh, another huge release. Uh, and, and, you know, traditionally, while Fluentbit's always been known for the log side, uh, really emphasizing a lot of the metrics, traces piece, uh, a lot of hotel compatibility, some of the SQL uh, processing and the metrics trace processing. So I'm really excited today. Uh, we're going to talk about processing kind of all up into 101. And then we're going to talk a little bit about 3.0. And uh, I like to keep things super live. So we're going to do a bunch of demos. Uh, you know, demo demo demons, hopefully not not with me today. So we'll we'll uh we'll try our try our best. And if there's some things that you want to see, please don't hesitate, throw some uh, stuff in the QA. I uh, love to make this as as uh, useful for for folks who are joining us live as as possible. So uh, next time you, you join live, you can ask uh, something else too. Cool. Without further ado, let me go ahead and get get started. Uh, just a quick uh, you know note to me. I'm you know I'm I'm on our, uh, from Clipto, one of the co-founders, also now part of uh, the Chronosphere team. So I'm a maintainer of the Fluent Bit ecosystem. Been there since uh, uh, Fluent D days ten years ago. Uh, super active in in many of the Slack channels. You might see me see me around. Um, love to talk, to, you know, through podcasts or CNCF type uh, type mediums. And I have done a little bit of of contributions to to logging in action. We'll have some some more fun stuff with uh, from from Phil later in the presentation. But uh, yeah, you know, if you've been around the Fluent community, you've seen me. And if if we haven't met yet, uh, you're looking forward to to chatting. Now, what we're going to do today, um, as I mentioned before, talk a little bit about processing with Fluent Bit. I'll give you a little bit of 101, um, but you know, if there's there's definitely other great uh, sessions that that we have that you can go look at for the Fluent Bit Academy around Fluent Bit and and what it does. We're going to talk really specifically about V3, so metrics, traces, uh, doing some processing with SQL. Um, I'll actually pull up the docs so we can kind of go through it live and and see how. We can take what's in the docs and use that to do some of the transformation pieces. And uh, of course, I want to uh, cater to some good use cases, right? So whether that's enrichment, transformation, reduction, how do we make sure that we're doing the the, the most powerful stuff that we can um, here as, as possible? Now, uh, just a quick intro to, to Fluent Bit, um, right? We're logs, metrics, traces, all in one, something you deploy at the very edge. Uh, you can also receive data and, and process data from incoming data streams. So whether that's networking data, whether that's other agent data, like the universal forwarder from Splunk or Beats or Logstash or Telegraph, uh, you can receive that data, do the processing. We're fully OTEL compatible. Um, and, and this is really exciting from V3 is the addition of HTTP2 and gRPC makes us really great with the OTEL protocol. Uh, and of course, that supporting logs, metrics, traces, really performant, really lightweight. Uh, you know, you can see a bunch of public benchmarks that folks have posted uh, from from multiple uh, um, usage. How does this thing work at ten thousand, hundred thousand message scale? And uh, you know, with talking about processing today, it's more than a simple pipe, right? It's this is something that's super widely used, uh, and and certainly it can help you get from A to B, but how do we make it so that you can do way more? Uh, and, and that's what we're going to cover in, in, in this session. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the architecture, because I, I think that's always important when we think of how do we collect data from, from Fluentbit? Where does the processing actually happen? Uh, and how does this architecture influence uh, our, our, our way of doing processing? Or where do we enable processing within, within an architecture? So for those who might be familiar or already using FluentBit, most likely you're leveraging FluentBit in, in this scenario. And what a node can mean, it could be something like a Kubernetes node, it could be something like a virtual machine, an on-prem server, uh, a Raspberry Pi, your laptop, and we are collecting local data. So that can be metrics generated at the, at the operating system level. It can be logs generating at the operating system level. It could be traces from nearby applications. And then we're routing it to multiple different destinations. So this is probably our most typical way of, of deploying and using Fluentbit, especially if you're on a Kubernetes or cloud-native environment 
were typically deployed as a, as a daemon set. Now, the other cool thing that you can do with FluentBit is you can chain it together with itself. And this is where FluentBit can run as a, an aggregator. Sometimes folks refer to this piece of architecture as a collector or a pipeline, a telemetry pipeline. And we can take all the data you're collecting at that very, very edge piece and routing it to heavier instances of, of FluentBit. So from an architecture side, you have a lot of variety and flexibility on how you want to do that processing. Do I want to do it immediately as I collect the data? Or do I want to do it where I have a dedicated instance that's receiving that data, that's doing the collection, the transformation, some of the processing that we're going to show today, and then routing to multiple places. Now let's talk a little bit about the internal. So if we zoom in on a FluentBit instance and we look at the data structures uh, and how they go in, you have an input side, you have parsing, you have filtering, you have buffering, you have routing. Uh, and one of the big pieces that comes in with FluentBit and why this is so useful is when we are receiving data and we're routing it to multiple places, what we had to do in FluentD was we had to copy that stream of data. So let's say, for example, I'm receiving logs and I want to send it to um, a, I don't know, open search cluster and I want to send it to a uh, block storage, like maybe, sorry, uh, Amazon S3 or something. So I want to route to two different locations. Typically, we have to copy all that data and do the processing that way. Here with FluentBit, uh, we made it so the routing essentially looks at a copy of the data. So you almost have like folks are familiar with pub subtype models. You're publishing data via collecting it and you're subscribing to that data via these, these different outputs. And where does this grant a lot of power in the processing side of it is we can do processing at the collection side. We can do processing with parsing. We'll talk a little bit about what that means here in a little bit. And then you can do processing per output. And where that's really cool is if I'm sending to open search and S3, I could say, um, I only wanna send a subset of that data to open search. Maybe I wanna redact some things in there so folks who are using it can't really see all of the contents of that log. And on the S3 side, I'm sending everything. It's raw, it's uncompressed, whatever it may be, it's firing it out there. So the, the data flows unimpeded, ready for archival, great for security audit, uh, great for folks to search maybe with something like an Athena or, or alternative. So now let's jump into what is that, those little boxes for, for processing. And I always think it's useful first to just kind of understand where what processing is, because I think everyone can say processing and we might have different versions of it in, in our own mind, right? We might be processing logs, we might be thinking about a computer processor. So what is this data processing and, and processing from FluentBit look like? And I think one thing that's really interesting is we look at how folks have been solving this today, right? You have typically collection data that's being generated. And then you have these pretty massive, large Java tools, right? Your Flinks, your Kafka, your NiFi, your Spark. And they're essentially running stream processing or other processing on top of that collected or raw data. Now, these are really powerful, but they're heavy. Um, and, and especially when we think of distributed compute, uh, some of the advantages that can come with that is if I have a thousand containers, uh, increasing that by 0.01% or 0.1% to do some processing is far more effective than spinning up another thousand core box to do all the, all the processing. So this is where some of the, the advantages of why do we want to do processing. Um, and I've seen a, a lot of this uh, lately as folks who've got awesome things for, for Kafka for long-term storage or Kafka for routing to multiple things saying, hey, we're kind of abusing Kafka or abusing Kinesis or abusing Event Hub. And we really just need to do some parsing. We need to do a little redaction here. We need to do a little dropping of, of the data. Um, and instead of having to do that all in this really heavy, larger object, um, why not just do it while you collect the data, right? Where, where, where it might make sense. I'm not saying you don't need to use these tools, just, hey, if you can do it, and you can do it cheaply, you can do it on the edge, you can do it as you collect it, why not? 
So really, that's where we're, we're, we're able to gain some of that, that advantage. So let's talk a little bit about, and you know, here just kind of, again, where we think of collection, buffering, ingestion, storage. Let's talk about why, why po po um, processing in general, right? What, what are the use cases that we can actually go in and, and do with this thing, right? Say processing all day, but what does it actually mean? I like to think of um, you know all, all of these as as important, and I'll talk about some of the impact that you can have as an organization by doing it. If I want to send a ton of raw logs, many times it just comes in as a raw blurb of text, and I might want to add schema to that, right? I might want to only look at something if I have a uh, two hundred error code from or HTTP response code from. A, uh, a server. I don't, maybe I don't care if it had a 303 or 301 re redirect or the vice versa. I only care about if I have a 404 or a 500. Uh, so adding schema allows us to really look and say, well, what, what happened here? What's going on with this uh, particular field or, or gain some sort of uh, schema out of that? It's really important when we think about open telemetry uh, and, 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 and the schema that that affords us is we want to build the schema. So we get all those dashboards that light up, right? If uh, if I'm looking at an IP, maybe I'm doing some malicious IP scanning in my backend tool. So I want to extract an IP that that, that system understands. The next is removing sensitive information. And, and you know, where where is the impact for my organization come with doing this is really, if I think about sending data up to a service and that service duplicates my data five times and I accidentally sent a number, a credit card number, and that thing is now leaked, for example, just one example. Now I have to go and make sure that the durability that I'm afforded with block storage like S3 is not causing me problems with replicating all my sensitive data. So doing that as the data is being generated is perfect because now it's in my data center, it's in my environment, it's in my sovereignty. So we don't have to worry about it leaking out. Where did it, where did it go? What happened to it? Uh, and and that that also comes into play with noisy logs. Um, you know, I'll be the first to admit I have created many log messages, uh, system out print line. Hey, this is the value of X variable, and, and and sometimes we forget to remove those things when we roll into production or roll it into um, roll an application out. So we want to just get rid of things that don't matter. This can even be fields, right? Sometimes we have a bunch of fields that are useless. Uh, and as much as I love schemas, there's a lot of repetition in schemas. I have version maybe four times in a log file. Um, and I don't, I don't need that to be there four times because many times I'm paying for that data, data amount. And if I'm paying for that data amount, having version four times is affording me no benefits. Um, it's in fact, just, just increasing the cost of, of what, what I need to play, pay. And the opposite is also true, adding context. So instead of just removing something, if I have a log message that says, hi, who cares? Um, it's, it's not useful, the outcome isn't there. But if I say, hi, I exist on this pod, this node, and at this time where I'm not supposed to have any applications running, that context is pretty important because now I had an application that was spitting out messages at a time it's not supposed to be running. So that context can be things like the host name from the host. It can be things like AWS. It can be Kubernetes metadata. Um, all sorts of things there that, that are useful uh, in, in context to understand and debug and troubleshoot, make things faster for, for us after we, we can process it. Now I got a question, you know, is it possible to know what kind of data metadata we're collecting from input to take further action on it? Uh, Yes, um, you know th th this is this is the big thing where when we are collecting from log files, we want to be able to one start to build some of the schema, and actually it's a great segue to like parsing. We can take raw logs and we can extract only certain portions of it, so we can act on it. We know what we're doing with it. We can exclude it. Uh, a great example of that is is the the parsing with like an HTTP access log, and that's. For the primary data set that we're gonna gonna show today for some of that V3 processing. So let's talk about parsing, right? Extractions of, of key value pairs. 
And if we think about like an Apache, MySQL, even a JSON map, the, these are just a bunch of text at the end of the day, right? It's this text has a space in between that text versus a space in that text. While you have in a JSON map, it's a little better. There's some already existing key value pairs, log, blank, this, blank, this, blank, uh, that have some, some reputation, representations and meanings. Now, if we just let things fly in blind, we kind of have to go and tell the system what everything means. And this is going to be kind of expensive if you're sending you know, hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes of data to a particular backend. You're essentially saying, okay, go read this raw text, extract this information, and do this for all the information. So again, that centralized versus decentralized compute. Uh, and, and sometimes, excuse me, uh, sometimes the, the schema on read is not particularly efficient. It's, it's a pretty heavy process. Um, schema on read means like as we're doing the query, we're defining the particular schema that, uh, that needs to be structured from unstructured data. And the good thing with, with Fluent is there's a ton of built-in parsers out of the box, right? We have Apache, Nginx, Mongo, Kubernetes. Um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of examples in GitHub about Kafka, Chef, RabbitMQ. Um, you know, if you want, you can search parsing and, and you'll most likely find uh, how, how you, can, you can get this. Now, of course, you can define a custom parser, and I'll show you how to do some of that in V3 and single config file, which is really cool. Uh, but, but of course, like you've got the community here, you've got the Fluent Slack channel. You can go ask, hey, anyone got a parser for X, Y, Z? Um, and if, if not, hey, awesome, you can contribute that to uh, to the team as well. And the other big thing is multi-line messages. So, you know, when we think about a, a message like the following, right, a stack trace that comes in. We might not want to take this in as a single message, right? If I have maybe this message flowing to a ton of backends or or a single backend, I would hate, I would hate, hate, hate if this first line was separate from the second line, which might be a thousand records down, just because I'm always collecting a bunch of things. I need it in context to see what happened, why did this fail, what happened with the stack race. And Multi-line messages are another great way that you can do some of the some of that parsing. And yes, there's a bunch of ones that are built in there uh, as well, right? Go, Ruby, Kubernetes. You can define your own custom multi-line parsers, so you're not necessarily uh, stuck on any of that too. The last one, um, this is kind of more for a fluent bit classic mode. I'll teach you how to use it with the the new mode just right after this is filters. Um, and these are the ones that have like modify, grep, include, exclude, checklist. So I'm doing maybe a security use case where I'm doing indicator of compromise and I want to look up against a specific uh, IP. Maybe I want to add some geolocation. Maybe I want to do some Kubernetes enrichment. And there's, there's a ton of um, filters out there. And most of those now run as processors. Uh, so the processors are a brand new concept where they run as part of um, the the actual process. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and switch into a different tab here. And cool. Hoping folks can see my screen. Perfect. Okay, it looks like looks like folks can. And um, on this, I have Fluent Bit uh, Rio running. So if I just let me just do a quick, quick output input. Yep, we got our version 3.0 running. I'm just generating some log-based metrics like CPU. And so you know we can we can start to play around with it. So the nice thing about V3 and processing is we now have um, one, we'll talk a little bit about the, the existing log-based processing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, a Lua, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the trace and metrics processing, which I think is is pretty fun. Um, of course, with with the SQL side. So first, let's talk about uh, some of the uh, side of of logs. Let me go ahead and just copy that file out, and we'll use uh, Vim to to go in there. Let me refresh this because I adjusted the size.
Perfect. And what we're doing here is I'm tailing a file that exists uh, in my path. Um, I'm reading from that and I have this new section called processors that allows me to do some transformations or processing on top of it. Now let's uh, go ahead and, and uh, just for the sake of this, we're gonna just comment all this out right now. And then we print that out into standard out in, in JSON lines. So if we run blend bit, some invalid spaces here. It's from this line. Ah, and a good question coming in as we're running this, with the plans regarding config file format, would it uh, be moved to YAML completely? Should I start writing my configs in YAML? Uh, for the latter, I'll answer the latter piece first. Yes, if, if you can start moving things to YAML, um, that's where most of the new features are gonna be enabled actually. We're, we're not deprecating classic format yet, but if you want to leverage some of the new features like the processor side piece or some of the SQL or some of the inbuilt parsers, you got to use YAML for that. That's our, our carrot for, for moving over to that, uh, that config, config format. So it's still supported. So if you have old config files, they're going to work. Um, you know, maybe at some point, maybe Fluent 4 or something like that will deprecate it out. But um, yeah, you know, all the new features are gonna be in, in, in YAML first or YAML only. Um, cool. So yeah, here we have, we're just reading very simple log file uh, and we're doing some very basic schematization. So for those that don't know, when you read a raw log with uh, Fluent Bit, it adds automatically this log key. Um, so this doesn't look too nice. Let's just add a uh, JQ, so we can see that a little, little more uh, readily. And it's about 450 line um, uh, Apache, I think Apache or Nginx log file. And with that, um, right, it's just printing out all those logs one by one. Uh, and it has, each one has a date and it has a, a log key. So let's go in and start to do some processing on top of this. Now, if I was running the classic mode, um, like Dennis asked, I would add a parser, I would have my inbuilt parsers, and then I would just refer to the parser in my log file. And I could still do that, no problem, right? I can add a um, parsers and I could say Nginx, and it would refer to the Nginx parser that's uh, that's built in or that's referred to in the, the config file, but I'm not gonna do that. Let's just pretend I don't have a built-in parser. And this is where the processors start to come into play. So from a processor side, I can say processor. You'll notice there's logs there. So we're only acting on things that are incoming from a log side. And I'll use the content modifier um, processing rule. And it has a pattern, it has a regex um, that's associated with it. So I'll reference the, you know, the, the official documentation. I have this processors piece here. I have my content modifier and in the content modifier, I can define my action. Um, I can define what that action is. And I'm going to use the ex extract one. And the extract example do, 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 has a pattern that's defined that gives me a regex to extract a certain certain thing from a from a key. So, so let's go back to our uh, side here. So key, remember everything came in that log field. We have our pattern. We're gonna keep the SQL one commented out for now. We'll keep the exact same output, standard out JSON lines works pretty well. And hopefully I didn't botch any indentation things. And awesome, cool. So now we've extracted log, uh, it's being parsed, and we now have all these different fields, right? We've got um, the extracted field. We still have the log field that's there, but now we have size, we have code, we have all sorts of things that we can then um, go and use to further go do some um, some processing on. So, um, you know, 450 lot printing 450 lines on this web based one is a little slow, slower than I'd like. Um, so I'm just going to try to control C out of this uh, for a little bit. Maybe we'll reduce the size of it so it doesn't take as long here. Just go to 
line 100 and uh, use the rest of them. Hopefully that'll run a little faster for us um, so we can do some, some more cool things. Okay, let's go ahead and we'll write another content modifier. So what if I wanna do two things, right? I extracted a bunch of things. Um, someone asked the good question, hey, what about, um, you know, if I'm using a particular uh, field, how do I know about that ahead of time? Will I know about it ahead of time? Well, we just schematized it, so we know what those fields are going to be, right? Host, size, etc. And let's choose another fun action. Maybe, uh, well, not maybe, yeah, let's do hash, right? Why not? Let's say hash, and then we'll do it. It has to act on a specific key. So we'll say hash, and we'll choose a key here. And that key can maybe be the agent. So we're going to hash the agent uh, key here. Let's go ahead and save that. Um, someone asked a good question, Joshua. Is Fluentbit eventually replacing Fluentd? Uh, I would say all of the new innovative things around OTEL support, logs, metrics, processing, SQL processing, that's all coming in Fluentbit. Uh, and we're continuing to invest in that. So that's that's where we're making most of our investments. It's much, much faster, much easier. We found at least much easier to use. Uh, and, and we've built most of the feature sets that are required for folks to move from Fluent D to Fluentbit. So Fluent D, I think, is, is still around. If you've got it, cool, awesome. And if you're looking to optimize it, reduce you know, your, your percentage. There was a great presentation, um, I want to say, by RazorPay last week. Uh, that, that talked about their journey from full and data to full and bid and actually the infrastructure savings, which I think was like 90%. So certainly we have many, many folks, cloud providers were doing it a few years ago, switching from full and data to full and bid. Uh, we're seeing some more use cases by, by uh, user examples. And, um, you know, here with, with most of the stuff that we're adding, uh, we're adding more and more things in, in full and bid. That's where most of our, our, uh, innovation is, is coming in. Okay, so we'll go ahead and run that. And we'll notice uh, even 100 logs is still kind of slow to print out, but- Anurag, it, another question uh, being asked around UTF-16 support. Ooh, that's that's a good one. I, I don't know, actually off the top of my head, I have to go, go check. Um, my thought is yes, maybe with things like uh, uh, particularly uh, Windows events, but um, I, I'll have to go check. I'll have to go check. I don't want to steer you wrong. Okay. Um, so looking at this, right, we did two things. We extracted and then we, on top of that, ran another content modification to hash this particular field. So agent uh, was then hashed. So, you know, before it might have said like Mozilla 5, Windows, whatever. And now it's just giving us some uh, some some hash uh, on on top of that. So certainly uh, some good things that we can do with with the content modification. But let's go in and use something else here. Maybe delete. So once we've extracted all these fields, we probably don't need this log field anymore, right? And and that's something that's not uh, too useful for us. It's probably just adding weight to the entirety of the log message. So we'll come back in here. We'll add another content modifier. Again, just sequentially adding it. Name content modifier. Action delete. And I believe it just was key. Let's check the docs. Yep, I think that's good. Let's see it. And okay, that looks a lot cleaner, right? We don't have the log side of the um of the message anymore it's just the extracted bits we still got agent that's being hashed cool so we could redact it two ways get rid of the field entirely or we just hash it um so so that way it's uh, it's not not showing um and now that's just how to save on the uh, I, I would say save on the message size but maybe we just want to actually exclude the entirety of that uh, that message. So let's go back to content. And what we'll do here instead is we will use a 
And another uh, question around deployment. All right. Oh, yeah. Is a Flimpit operator the preferred way to deploy Flimpit? Or are there benefits using this approach over deploying Flipit directly through Helm chart? Um, you know, I I I would say operators are are always great for those that prefer custom resource definitions. You might have tooling that works really well with it, holding an Argo, a Jenkins, a CI CD pipeline. Um, using the custom resource definitions works really well. Uh, so I think it's really just a matter of preference. Sometimes if you want to keep things dead simple, Helm chart works. Um, I, I would say when you look at namespace segmentation and, and all of that, that's where a Helm chart config can get kind of crazy. Um, and especially if you're doing rapid performance or rapid processing changes, uh, you know, the daemon set architecture doesn't necessarily work as, as well or or, or can have its drawbacks, I should say, right? A hundred node cluster, you're rolling out a hundred new config changes across that entire estate. That's where an operator, even like we talked about earlier, this aggregator collector concept that sits in the middle. Um, I'll do a shameless plug for Clipia. That's also where our product sits in is uh, it, it could both act as a control plane for the daemon set and a control plane for the, the um, middle layer uh, plugs in. So. It's a good architecture pattern. Um, it works really well if you've got the the stuff around custom resource definitions. A uh, certainly a good way to deploy. The advantage is really dependent on your use case and what you're trying to do here. So um, back to excluding logs. Instead of doing this via the um, some of the included ones, I think we could use the grep filter uh, here. I'm going to actually just showcase a little bit of the SQL side. Uh, so let's go back here. And uh, I already have it kind of pre-cooked. So we'll go ahead and, and use it there. And from the SQL side, I can run a query. And from the query, we're going to select uh, the messages. Maybe we'll select uh, host, user, time, method, and code. Um, and we're going to do that from the stream, but we'll also add kind of similar to what I have right below where code is equal to, I don't know, 404. Hopefully I have a 404 in there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do this. And so now I am parsing. I am uh, doing the redaction. I am uh, doing the uh, SQL statement on top of it. Uh, okay, and it looks like I'm not printing anything out. Let's go back here. Let's go see why. Uh, maybe let's just start with 200s. I don't have a 404 there. Let's do it back here. And yeah, we're selecting those four fields and we're only selecting the ones that have the code of um, of 200. So certainly a good... Um, uh, a, a good good way to go go about doing that. Um, and a good question, Flipbit 3 support near future remote windows log collection like Clip2 Core and Flipbit D. What about MQTT input support? Uh, yeah, we're, we're probably going to add the remote um, windows log collection. Uh, I think probably the, the main reason we haven't done so yet is just kind of making sure it works really well. And there's a lot of variety we found with uh, some of the newer stuff in Windows with 2022. Uh, and then I'd say the the latter piece um, on that question is MQTT MQTT input. I uh, always have a uh, have some some difficulty with that. Is that supported? Um, I, th I think it's always been supported. I don't know if that's that's changed um, at all. In fact, let's see. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, it looks like it's here. So we've got the MQTT input. Uh, maybe it's not uh, compiled in. We can always uh, uh, always just check here. Uh, let's do it live. So we're running off Flimpit, then Flimpit on QTT. Um, let's check it out. Yeah, it's there. So yeah, you've got, uh, oh, output for MQTT. Yeah, okay. Oh, so, so close. So close to just uh, resolving all of that in the webinar. Um, it's not there would greatly appreciate a contribution for it. Maybe you can borrow very heavily from MQTT. Uh, 
So um, certainly, certainly something that can can be done there. Okay, so we use Flint D heavily as aggregators. What would be the effort of migrating Flint at V3? It wouldn't be a good time to migrate. We need to ensure all features using Flint D um, are also in Flint at V3. Uh, certainly not just tomorrow you're going to be running Flint Bit. Um, you know, we've worked with folks that have tens of thousands, if not 50,000s plus type of um, uh, type of deployment. So one that we are, we have, we try to plan it out where what features are using in Fluent D, what custom plugins are using in Fluent D. Is it self-written? Is it something that's from the community? How do we go and, and convert that to Fluent Bit or use what Fluent Bit has? Typically, you can get 95% of the way there. There's certainly exceptions like, um, you know, Fluent Bit has a plugin for MQTT is my guess. Um, so certainly want some of those things where you want to look at what use cases you can you can have. I would definitely recommend the next piece of this webinar series uh, hosted by Lacaris. We're going to talk a little bit about operations and all of that too. And um, that will go into some more depth um, as well of like, how do you go and uh, and, and do some of this stuff. Um, and, and also you could just get a sense of, hey, I'm using Fluent D as an aggregator. What would it look like if we're operating Fluent Bit? What's exposed to me? What's useful? What's what's meaningful? Um, is multi-worker supported in Fluent Bit? It is per output plugin. You can specify workers. Uh, one of the nice things about the processors uh, here as well within, um, within the configuration is those are running in their own threads, uh, which is always cool. So you get a little bit more performance using this type of um, uh, processing. Now, uh, let's say we don't want to use a SQL. We want to use one of the inbuilt processor, uh, inbuilt filters. We can also then have, let's just, uh, let's use the grep one, for example, grep, and uh, let's just say speed at the config here. And we'll say uh, from that, maybe log, under 200, over 200. Let's see if that will uh, function as we ex expect. Um, actually, yeah, we shouldn't see anything because we're excluding the 200s, which is all the logs as we found out with the SQL. So if we come back in here, um, we'll actually change it to just include that. It's not even the correct. It shouldn't be here, it should be regex. Yes, regex is field. And first, the first demo demon. So I got to go figure out what's going on with the, the grep filter as a processor. But ideally, this would just let you use the filter um, as is. No. With all the content modifiers and the SQL, right, they're great for shaping the data a little bit or, or doing some of the modification, but certainly there's some times that we're going to have customization, right? There's things that go beyond what's included out of the box, and that's where uh, Lua comes in. So for those who are not familiar, Lua is um, scripting language uh, primarily used um, with web, web servers, if you use um, maybe Nginx or some, some things like Kong, they've got Lua built in, uh, some gaming as well, good gaming scripting. So that's um, that's certainly one of the, the, the great pieces of, um, one of the great pieces of how do we go and, and do uh, some, some of this stuff of like, hey, I want to modify this record, but I want to do conditional and I want to do this, I want to do that. Uh, certainly Lua is a really good place uh, for that. There's a a nice sandbox that we have within the, um, we, we have one of the, uh, um, it's like things like on a GitHub page. So you can use that to test out Lua um, and and have that as as part of the uh, the same type of processing or, or outputs. So next I wanna talk a little bit about metric and traces. I know we skipped forward to the SQL stuff, but we'll, um, we'll come back to that a little bit and we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about metrics. So the nice thing is with, uh, Fluent Bit 3.0, we now have uh, pro processors for uh, metrics. It's a very, very basic level. And then we also have these same content modifiers also work on traces. And so th those are great, great ways to now do like, hey, I want to hash this span or I want to do this, whatever it may be, maybe convert some values. Uh, you have, have all of that uh, compatibility 
uh, there there as well, right? And you can specify which context type is actually getting affected. Uh, then in Fluentbit 2.2, we introduced additional metadata and attributes to really mesh well with open telemetry. Now we actually have something from a processing side that that matches that uh, that output. So let's talk about metrics. And so for that, I think I have yeah, this uh, metric selector. And before we do anything like that, let's just do something like that, just to, hey, we're gonna grab all of the exact metrics right now. Um, so we're grabbing fluent bit metrics every 10 seconds. What does that look like? Not a error here. So I forgot to comment these out. And after 10 seconds, we should print out internal fluid bit metrics. So things like, hey, okay, what's my input rate, my bytes, uh, my filter, my outputs, um, all of that printing out to, to standard out right here. Typical Prometheus format with, hey, here's my host name, et cetera. We could even do, um, you know, fluid bit metrics might not be as interesting. If I'm also using something like node exporter, I can also do here. Node exporter metrics, the same scrape and arrow. Uh, 10 seconds is a little long. Let's just do one. And this is going to be one of those areas where you're just blasted with logs, right? Like, look how many of these things are, are being um, you know, generated. Uh, it's it's an insane amount, right? And, and you know, if I want to really bog down the system, maybe we do a little bit of process metrics too. Look at this, it's getting all of the systemd unit state files. Um, it's an insane amount of metrics, right? That I probably don't need to be scraping every second. I've probably made a, a bad error by doing that. Um, and, and now my server is a little unresponsive for the size I've, I've provisioned. So let me do the simple way to go fix a lot of this. I'm just gonna refresh it. And we'll change this from one second to 10. And now instead of you know getting overwhelmed by the amount of metrics that are being generated, let's just go and grab very specific ones. So let's go grab processor metrics. We'll use a metric selector and um, let's include uh, like storage. Yeah, we can do we can do storage metric name. So we're going to generate all those metrics again. And then we're only going to keep the ones that include storage within. I, I'll let that run for just a couple seconds. And if we come back to metric selector, you can see here, right? We're, we're doing an action include or an exclude. Um, and then, you know, the metric name that's within that prom metric. Cool. So here, generating a bunch of these. Process started. Um, which ones contain slash storage? Here's we got some storage. In fact, let's go and look back. Did I even, in, yeah, action include? Uh, maybe let's go and do another one on top of this. Metrics selecting. Metric and vests. Uh, So further, uh, kind of go go down into what what we are collecting and what we're not collecting. That's also useful because we added process exporter back in um, uh, back in the two point two series, uh, and also Windows exporter for for Windows. So you know it's always useful to be able to say hey. You want to include something that includes this or include something that includes this um, and have all of that there. So, yeah, I think that's, you, know, you could do some label metric uh, 
thing. So you're deleting a, a label like metric name. Um, here it's excluding some stuff. So you get kind of all of those those basics uh, as as well. So what we've covered so far, we went through what is processing. We ran a few processors. We extracted some regex for V3. We then aligned it with a few more content modifiers. And we did a bit of metric collection from the from the host. We did a little bit of metric collection from Flimpit itself. We included some of those metrics. We excluded some of the other ones. Um, and, and basically that was our, that's that's what we were able to accomplish. We didn't do any of the trace processing. Uh, you know, I'll leave that to, to folks. Maybe that's another good one is here's all the new stuff with Hotel uh, in, in a future webinar. Uh, 